What is going on everybody? Thank you so much for a thousand subscribers. Let's keep this train going. Hit that subscribe button, notification bell. You know the deal. Let's get this channel to the moon. A lot of you are in the market for the Lexus GX470 and I want to show you how to buy one in this video. It's going to be a bit different, a bit more in depth, a bit more meticulous. So get ready. I'm going to tell you all you need to know before you start looking for a Lexus GX470. Before we start, I know a lot of you are more experienced than I am with this platform. So if you have any additional insights, go ahead and leave them in the comments for everybody down below. Let's go. First, a little background on the Lexus GX470. It's a Toyota Land Cruiser Prado 120 for rich 2000s people. If you're not familiar, the Toyota Prado 120 is sold all around the world and is known as the go-to vehicle for the toughest terrain from Africa to the Middle East and Australian Outback. This car is trusted by hundreds of thousands of drivers around the world. And what they did is they brought this car to America, slapped some bling bling badge engineering on it. Oh, and also they gave us one of the best engines ever produced. The cast iron block, 90 degree configuration, dual overhead cam, aluminum head 2UZ FE engine. Motorreviewer.com says, the 2UZ FE engines are almost bulletproof, the most reliable and durable engines from the Toyota Corporation. These engines do not have any design flaws, meaning lash, noise, and wheezing cannot be found. They also say, the engine longevity depends on how well and periodically it was maintained, the quality of oil and gas, driving style and conditions. But the non-problem average mileage for cars with a 2UZ FE is about 300,000 miles. These incredible engines are backed by the same bulletproof reliable A750F transmission that sends power through the entire Toyota light truck lineup. That includes the Lexus GX470 and LX470, the Toyota 4Runner, the Toyota FJ Cruiser, Toyota Land Cruiser, Toyota Sequoia, Toyota Tacoma, and the Toyota Tundra. That transmission sends power to an extremely sturdy two-speed Torsen locking center differential to distribute power to all four axles with the front axles being part of an independent front suspension double wishbone system and a solid rear axle setup. Supporting this powertrain is a tough as nails body on frame construction that while considered old school is the best way to ensure the best off-road performance and longevity in bumpy situations. In essence, it's a V8 4Runner of the same era with better quality interior materials, a nicer exterior design in my opinion, but it hasn't been thrashed off-road by 10 previous owners and serviced exclusively on the driveway. It has more likely been pampered, taken to the dealership its whole life for service, and has never so much as considered getting driven off-road. Although if you watch this channel, you'll know that these things are begging to get in the dirt. So let's get started with number one. First, consider the year that you're looking for. 2004 was the first year where they sealed the transmission. 2003, you'll notice there are two dipsticks, one for the engine and one for the transmission. The 2004 year got rid of the transmission dipstick, sadly, and said, we're going to give you this special WS fluid that is supposed to quote unquote last the life of the vehicle. So meaning you can't check the transmission fluid, unfortunately. Now, you should know that no transmission fluid will last the life of this vehicle. I think the product planners didn't understand how reliable this truck would be. So if it's a higher mileage GX470, I would highly recommend getting that looked into. But enough of that, we'll talk about that later. For 2005, that was the first year of the VVTi engine. You have variable valve timing with intelligence, as Toyota calls it. So that bumps the horsepower from 235 up 35 to 270 horsepower. That's a significant gain. Although there's no torque peak advantage, uh, torque delivery on these cars might be better. I have not driven one, so I don't know. 
One thing I like about having pre-VVT engines uh, in my GX 470s is that it's a less complex design which may contribute to overall longevity. Also, it doesn't have that extra boost in performance, so you may consume a, a little bit less fuel. So you have those added benefits with uh, 2003 and 2004 over the variable valve timing 2005 and on models. Second of all, for the 2005s, you get Bluetooth connectivity. And also, finally, you get a plastic intake manifold which replaces the 2003 and 2004 aluminum one. In 2007, you got a new generation of navigation and some other minor in-car technology upgrades like a DVD player and things like that. 2008, we saw the exterior changes like chrome door handles and a darkened grille and different wood and leather options but overall it stayed the same from then on. Those are the main differences between all the years. Number two, a recent timing belt and water pump kit service. Now I wanna make sure I'm not just saying a timing belt because one of the reasons you're doing the whole kit, which includes the timing belt, water pump, some bearings, the timing belt tensioner, stuff like that, if those bearings, if that water pump seizes, it'll cause the belt to snap no matter what condition it's in. And as you probably know, if that belt snaps, you will get piston to valve collision and a bad day. So the more recent this is done, the better. And I singled this particular service out because it's the most expensive service item that should be done every 90,000 miles. Number three, service history. Get yourself a Carfax report. You can also go on the Lexus driver's site and go ahead and add the VIN you're looking at to your garage and it'll actually show you what Lexus has for service history. Definitely highly recommend doing this. You can also call Lexus corporate to see if they're able to give out any service records on the car you're looking at. Now secondly, if the seller claims to have had service done, ask for paperwork. Always ask for paperwork. If they say they lost it, see if you can call the shop. They said did it, and it's up to you if you wanna trust them that they did the work themselves or something like that, but make sure you factor that into the price because gaps in service history can give you negotiation room. Third, see if the transmission has ever been serviced. We talked about this a little bit before. If it's a higher mileage, 250,000 mile GX, it may need a transmission fluid flush. There's no such thing as a service-free transmission. And like I said before, the product planners probably didn't understand just how reliable they were making this thing. I know when I got my 155,000 mile GX, one of the first things I did is I took it in for a transmission service. The guy recommended that maybe we could do a drain and fill for half the price. And I said, let's do it based on the color of the transmission fluid. And he called me back. He said, yep, it's totally black. We need to flush this thing out. So glad I did that for peace of mind. Number four, modifications. Now there are good mods and bad mods. Good mods include a suspension lift from a reputable company, wheels, tires, armor, recovery points, things like that. Bad mods would be parts that are illegal in your state. So I wanna tell you guys what prompted me to make this video. Some friends of mine were in the market for a Lexus GX 470 and I caught several things in the one they were looking at. So this is a great instance of there being bad modifications. They sent me pictures of the underbody to look for rust and everything and I see this bright and shiny exhaust pipe which some may think, great, they replaced the exhaust and I asked if it was an OEM unit. Since we live in California, I looked up the manufacturer and they are not CARB or CARB or California Air Research Board certified. Therefore, my friends would not pass smog if they got this car. So we let the seller know that they were able to work it into the price. Now another type of bad mod are poorly installed mods in the good category I listed or just ugly ones like Say you have awful chrome wheels and you just don't like the look of them. You gotta take that stuff into consideration. Number five, the vehicle spec and trim level. The GX470 has a sport trim, which has darkened chrome headlights, stylish interior elements that 
get rid of the wood trim in favor of like a silver and a dark charcoal steering wheel and some other components in that dark charcoal color as well. I think it looks really good. You can have a GX470 with or without KDSS. KDSS is Toyota's really cool kind of variable anti-sway bar. So the front and rear of a car have anti-sway bars to prevent cars from basically rolling over when they go around corners. It keeps the cornering flat for the driver and it gives you nice feel when you're on the road. Now the problem is when you're off-road, anti-sway bars can prevent full articulation of the wheels. And you want articulation to keep as much traction as you can get onto the dirt. What KDSS does is it allows some variation in the stiffness of the sway bar. So it'll allow the car to flex off-road, but it'll also be able to tighten up to give a nice tight and flat cornering performance while on the road. That's a basic explanation. I highly recommend looking more into it. It's a cool system. I like it. Uh, next is tan versus black interior. So tan versus, say, gray interior, rather. So this is probably up to preference. Most people would probably prefer the darker interior, but you know, I don't mind my tan interior cars. They're, they're just fine in my opinion. And the last one is gonna be navigation versus non-nav. You may not expect this, but non-navigation sport models with KDSS are the unicorns everyone's looking for. These will fetch a bit of a premium because it is so difficult to replace the navigation unit equipped vehicles with an aftermarket unit. Whereas if you have the non-navigation, you can actually just swap out the radio no problem because the air conditioning controls are not integrated into the touch screen. So when you try to do this with the navigation model, you're going to have to source non-navigation air conditioning controls. That's why people would much prefer having non-nav models. If a dealer tries selling you on that point, you could tell them that actually non-navigation models are more desirable. If anything, the price should be lower. And best of luck with that. <laughs> Number six, recently repaired common mechanical issues that you would probably have to deal with eventually anyway. First of all, I'm not gonna be able to cover them all. So again, those of you who have had experience with other common issues, leave them down in the comments. The first one is the air injection pump failure, which will cause all the lights on the dash to illuminate and the car to, I guess it won't idle properly or something like that. I don't know exactly, but I know that I've seen it a lot on the forum and it's a common failure. If that was just repaired, say, that's a really good thing to have peace of mind about. The next one is gonna be your rear airbags. Now, I'm not talking about the things that keep you safe in an accident, I'm talking about your rear air suspension. The airbags on the air suspension like to fail, they leak, they get cracked, the rubber gets brittle. These things were never meant to last like a spring can. Fortunately, you can use that as a bargaining chip as it's fairly easy to replace the airbags and you can also go to a static spring setup which will give you more longevity and peace of mind as well. Finally, the last thing I'll talk about is plastic radiator end tanks like to fail and they get cracked and, and brittle and they can fail. So again, like I told you before, I was walking my friends through this purchase and I asked the salesman that we were FaceTiming who was way out of state and we definitely can't poke around the vehicle. I asked him to pop the hood. Some of the first things I said was, you know, let's see the oil, let's check here and there. And then I asked him to pop off the coolant reservoir cap. Once he did that, we all saw the coolant was down to zero. I thought since they did replace both the air injection pump and the water pump and timing belt at that same dealer. So I assumed that, you know, maybe they left it sitting for a couple days and they didn't fully bleed the system and it drank more coolant down. That wasn't the case after further inspection. The radiator 
had the leak and now they're getting that fixed for free because I was able to find that. So I just wanna make sure everybody listening to this video checks for all those things. Okay, and number seven, on that same note, this is going to be our inspection section. So make sure the seller has the car stone cold for you when you go to look at it. Sitting overnight is the best. You wanna cold start the car when you start it, it should run in the higher RPMs for a few minutes. Now during this time, you can go out and check that there's no smoke coming from the exhaust. And I'm talking about real smoke, not normal exhaust fumes that you might be able to see more on a cold morning. So next, if there's a loud ticking sound on the cold start, it may be serious engine issues or the exhaust manifold leak which can sometimes happen to these cars due to all the heat cycles and uh, corrosion and rust. It'll sound like a tractor until the car warms up and the metal expands enough to plug that hole, if it's able to do that at all. If it has this issue, expect to pay anywhere from a thousand, a thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars for that repair. Uh, you can factor that into the cost. If, if you do have that tractor sound, definitely understand that this will not be a cheap fix. When the car idles down, make sure it sits around five to 600 RPM and doesn't climb up or down or anything crazy like that. It should be smooth and even. All right, next up, rust. I should have had another section to consider the car's location its whole life, but I wanted to keep the list a bit shorter. Check the area, check the area the car spent most of its life in. They may still salt the roads there. So you're gonna wanna check underneath for anything beyond surface rust. The one that I was looking at for my friends appeared to have been garaged its whole life because the paint was perfect. But underneath, there was a bit more rust than I see on my GXs, which are both California cars. Next up, of course, you're gonna check the paint. Make sure everything is consistent. I would bring a really bright LED flashlight. If the car was an outdoor dog, uh, the clear coat's probably gonna be peeling in some places. Check the fenders, check the window sills, and check the roof. All of that can be factored into the price. Next, when you're hopping under the car, check for any leaks up by the engine. No leak residue should be acceptable unless, they, unless it looks like they just may have spilled some oil by the fill cap or something. If the seller says, oh, I topped up the fluids for your drive home or something like that, just walk away. It's leaking from somewhere. Same with the quote unquote AC recharges. Your AC system only needs to be refilled if it is leaking. Also, check underneath the transfer case. There's an O-ring that commonly fails on these things and you may be able to score a deal if you find it leaking, but everything else still works basically. I'm gonna throw up my other video, basically my first video that set off this YouTube channel where I show you how to fix the transfer case actuator O-ring seal for like five bucks instead of some people in the comments were saying they were quoted $3,000 because the dealership wanted to split the transfer case. Forget that, watch my video. If you find the transfer case actuator leaking on your preferred GX470, start rubbing your hands together because you may be able to get a deal and it's also an easy fix. Next, drive the car and listen for clunks in the suspension. One of the most common issues with these cars is the trusty clunk that happens when you're sitting at a red light for a minute or two. This is caused by when the air suspension starts to sag down a little bit, the drive shaft actually needs to telescope into itself, but it actually can bind because of lack of grease. So this can mostly be fixed by just doing drive shaft greasing every oil change or just switching to a static spring setup. But the seller doesn't need to know that. For all they know, this car clunks when it's sitting at a red light and it could be anything. So you can work that into the deal. Next up, make sure the car goes through all the gears that you can reasonably get it through. I know that you know there's speed limits and you may not be able to get into overdrive and stuff. Just drive it at different aggressiveness levels and speeds. Uh, try to feel for any hesitation or dash lights or anything like that. And in a safe spot, 
Go ahead and put the car in neutral and shift the transfer case to the low range. Listen for excessive grinding. In my eyes, a small amount is acceptable due to lack of a clutch, but it should go in no problem. Uh, if you're unable to wrestle it in or something, you know, make sure it's not in gear, make sure it's not in park, put it in neutral. If you have it in neutral, it should go in no problem. Next, you can go ahead and press the center diff lock button, which is right there by the seat heaters and make sure that light stops blinking reasonably quick three to five maybe ten seconds if it doesn't go in right away you could try driving uh, forward and backward it should stop blinking at that point sometimes like going into four-wheel drive for you know a tacoma sometimes you just need to roll back and forth a few times if it doesn't stop blinking the center diff lock actuator might not work and you won't have true four-wheel drive. So these things work like they're all-wheel drive all the time, but power always goes the path of least resistance. Torque is not split 50-50 between the front and rear axle all the time. You have to hit that center diff lock button in order for it to be a true four-wheel drive. So basically, if that button doesn't work and that light doesn't stop blinking, you don't have a four-wheel drive car, you have an all-wheel drive car. Next up, under the hood, see if the seller will let you take off this silver engine cover and just look around for any pink or red residue that could indicate a coolant leak. Uh, look for any frayed wires to coil packs or fuel injectors, excessive rust or debris that might indicate that a small animal may have made its home and had been living in there and chewing on stuff they shouldn't be chewing on. These aren't deal breakers all the time, but you need to be aware of them and you can also use them to negotiate with. Beyond that, check the oil dipstick and coolant reservoir. Like I said before in that story with my friends, I was FaceTiming the salesman and basically we together caught that there is a leak somewhere in the system. That coolant reservoir should be in the acceptable range on the side of the bottle. Uh, it can be it can go up or down depending on whether the car is on or off and things like that but honestly if it's been sitting it should be reasonably high if it's all the way drained there's either a leak in the system or it wasn't repaired properly so you need to get that figured out before you get the car and finally check under the oil cap smell the oil observe if there's anything milkshake like basically uh, milkshake like meaning it's a light brownish fluid that would indicate that water and oil is mixing if you find anything like that walk away because that car has a bad head gasket so thank you guys so much for watching sorry for the long-winded video there was a lot to cover and i know i still didn't even cover it all so again if you have any additional insights to provide everyone, just leave them in the comments and we'll see you in the next video.